Hello and welcome to the Questioning Behaviour podcast. My name is Sarah Bowen and as always I'm here with my lovely friend Viala Vandenacker. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. And of course, we're here with an absolutely great guest. And today that is Rafael Batista, which I think I semi pronounced correctly. So to immediately dive into it, Rafael or Raf, as often referred to, tell the crowd, who are you and what do you do? So my name is Rafael Batista. I do go by Raf as well. Uh, I'm a behavioral scientist. I consider myself a behavioral scientist for, for probably the last 10 years or so since, since I was in college. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Chicago, Booth School of Business. But my, my track, I guess, to get here, is, as we, we may be discussing, is a little bit circuitous. Prior to this, I was effectively the head of behavioral research uh, for the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. I did some time at the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics as, as a consultant. Of course, I, I've, uh, Merle and I have come from the same roots at, at Warwick, the University of Warwick, in, in their behavioral economics program. So that's kind of the short of it. I think the first thing to jump into, as I prefer to do things chronologically, the first question is, I know why I went to do the master's at Warwick, but why did you choose that master's? Why did you choose behavioral science as an education and career path to begin with? So for me, I had been confused for a while as to what I wanted to study. And so throughout college uh, in the US, you can have you can take many different types of classes. There's not really a structured curriculum. And so throughout my time, I basically dabbled in psychology classes and economics classes. And I had a sense of what behavioral economics might be. But my dad, who kind of was trained as an old school economist, always said, you have to choose one or the other. And for a while, I thought I was kind of just on the fence before I had to make a decision at some point. And, and so I think there was a natural progression to kind of be drawn to behavioral economics programs. I had a professor who had done a PhD kind of in this topic and uh, was kind of really motivating me to kind of pursue this as a PhD, as I think many in the U.S. do. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, I wasn't quite ready to commit to like a, a five-year journey. I, like I, I didn't really know what that was. I didn't have anyone around me that did a PhD. And so in, in some weird way, it, the master's at Warwick was, was a bit of a gap year to kind of test the waters in this field and spend some time in Europe, which is always fun for, for Americans. And so that that's kind of how I ended up at, at Warwick. Mm. Um, I'm sorry that you, I'm sorry your gap year was spent in Coventry of all the places in, in Europe. So nobody, but, um, warned, nobody warned me of that, yeah. but, but you know, yeah. you live and you learn, you live and you learn. Yeah. I'm a good still lesson. here. <laughs> So something I wanted to get your uh, opinion on is why go back to do the PhD? It sounds like you sort of were able to establish a good career for yourself in industry, you know, applying and practicing behavioral science. It's something that I've just seen a lot on Twitter of people sort of saying, you know, the PhD is redundant now, like you can learn to be a behavioral scientist without it. So for you, why return to academia after all that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question and, and one that, that internally and kind of socially I, I've struggled with some time because mm -hmm. when people ask, like, what do you want to do after the PhD? Part of my answer is that like, well, I'd consider going back into the exact same job that I was before or similar, right? Like to kind of practice behavioral mm -hmm. science and industry. Um, and as you said, kind of I, I, I was doing quite well at, at the firm that I was at. And so this question of why go back, why take a break almost? Um, rather than just kind of continue up the career ladder. We, we is, would like is, to emphasize that none of us thinks that a PhD degree is in any way, <laughs> shape, or form a break. <laughs> we would like to throw in this disclaimer. <laughs> That's good. That's a good disclaimer. I think in, in uh, yeah, maybe maybe break in the sense that like, uh, well, certainly in America, there's, there's often this tendency to just kind of try and climb the career ladder and kind of raise, mm -hmm. rise in the ranks. And, and so in that sense, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a timeout. And I think that I had a, a friend of mine who, who's an academic and a mentor who put it to me, I think, in a, in a pretty eye-opening way, uh, which I'll share with you guys now. So in one of our conversations while I was still at, at the Commonwealth Bank and, and doing research as part of my job, we got to talking about, like, how do you become really good at the thing that you're doing? Mm -hmm. And I think the way to sum it up is that in any industry that you choose to go into, 
there are some institutions or some organizations or some tracks that train you to literally be the best in that industry, right? And so you might be recognized if you want to go into banking, you might think about joining, like having a first job or, or trying to get into somewhere like the Bank of America or HSBC or one of these large financial institutions that train you to be a banker. If you want to go into consulting, you have Bain & Company or you have PwC, McKinsey, and these train you to be consultants. And they're very good at kind of the training to be that thing. Now, mm -hmm. for research, the place to get trained to be a researcher is in PhD programs, in academia. And these are institutions that literally over hundreds of years, in the case of, of academic institutions, have been practicing and refining their ability to train researchers. And so I think that if you want to be a researcher, there are ways to be a very good researcher in practice and home in on these skills kind of in practice. And I fully support people who decide to do that. For me, I was kind of drawn to this idea that if, if I want to be the best researcher I can be, then the PhD might be the place to get that training, uh, assuming I can get in and I have the time and, and the resources to, to kind of do that successfully. And so I was very lucky to get into the program that I did. But uh, once I did, it, it seemed like a no brainer because of kind of my passion for research. I mean, yeah, getting into Chicago booth, not exactly uh, a bad institution to be at, I'd argue. I, I, yeah, but I'll say this is the thing, one of those things that you often don't see just kind of from looking on somebody's CV. But for me, it took five years and three applications to Chicago booth. I mean, I was rejected for PhD programs, probably more than most people get rejected for PhD programs, because I, every time I applied, I basically got rejected. But I, I knew that I had, again, kind of the luck to to be in, in good jobs that, that I enjoyed and, and was paid relatively well. And so I kind of had like nice fallback options, so to speak. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, I, I was more and more convinced to kind of go into academia, despite the many times that I was rejected. And, and you're right, like now I'm at Booth and I'm, I'm extremely excited. So even I tell people that even if I don't continue on in any other way, or if I'm totally unsuccessful in this job, that I, I'm lucky to have had this experience. So. Mm. Thank you for sharing that with us as well. Like the fact that you didn't manage to get in like on your first couple of times. Because I think, yeah, it's right. We only really see the shiny CV. And I have looked at your CV in the anticipation of this. So that's that's good to know. I'm, I'm wondering whether or not you think that now you're in the PhD program, is it doing what you wanted it to do right now? Have you had enough experience in the PhD to be able to say whether or not actually yeah, this was, this was exactly the right choice. This is where I'm going to get trained to be the best researcher possible. Yes. And, and no, I'll start with a no. The no is that I'm learning things that I, I was not expecting to learn. Mm -hmm. And these have been some of the kind of the, the best lessons that I think that, that I've gotten so far out of the PhD. So in, in starting a PhD in behavioral science, the expectation, at least for me, was that I'd be learning a lot about behavioral science. Now, I might have come from a unique point that I had been working in mm -hmm. behavioral science and kind of thinking about this for, for a little while. And, and yes, I have classes in behavioral science, but I think what, what I've learned and that has been kind of more, most rewarding up to this point is kind of how to think about the world in a slightly different way, how to think about research in a slightly different way. And I think that that's been very generative. It's helped me to kind of see problems in the world that I think I, I wouldn't have seen before. And it's helped me to just kind of have like a, a fuller conversation with myself as I'm thinking about, well, why does this happen? And how do I come to better understand this? And how do we study this thing in the world in a way that, that kind of helps me truly understand it or explain it? And so I, I think that it's been, I have been trained or I'm being trained. Uh, and so in that sense, yes, PhD is kind of living up to the expectation that I had, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm being trained in things that, that I, I wasn't expecting to be trained in. And that's been, that's been quite rewarding. You literally just said that the PhD has made you see more problems in the world and that you started talking to yourself. I would say this is absolutely not <laughs> what you want from any type of program. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I, I think a lot of people have a misconception about the PhD with regards to how much topical training you're going to mm. get. Uh, in your case, with regards to behavioral science. I'm actually quite curious. So you've worked for both the Busara Center and the CBA in which, you know, you've applied behavioral science, plus you've had formal training in it as well. What were you still expecting to learn? I mean, quite a few things you should already know by this stage, don't you think? 
Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I think one thing that, that I, I still am learning, um, but but maybe hasn't taken center stage in, in kind of my training mm. is is how to really kind of narrow in on a question. So I think that the, the tendency that in practice is to kind of think very big and to be a generalist and to be able to apply kind of your skills and the training and the readings in, in a, like broad strokes um, and think about problems kind of on the fly and and to, to really be kind of diverse and the way that, that you kind of borrow from different literatures, but also dynamic in the way that you apply it. And that's not necessarily the same traits that, that a, a PhD tries to, to train people in. And so I think that the PhD has, in the behavioral science aspect, has been helpful in trying to kind of narrow in on a couple topics and how to like be more patient in a way uh, to think about one thing for a little bit longer and a little bit deeper. And so I think in, in that sense, I don't know if, if topical's the right word, because as you said, it's, it's not necessarily the place for that. You'll have your whole career ahead of you if, if you stay in academia to kind of dive into to specific topics and get to know that very well. But I, I think the training has helped kind of narrow in on behavioral science and, and specific topics within behavioral science that, that is, can be quite useful. Right. Mm. Yeah. Now that makes a lot of sense. So we've already honed in on the fact that behavioral science is there's there's quite a lot of stuff to still learn, even if you already had quite a lot of formal training. But we kept it rather vague. So now what exactly is it that you're doing in the PhD, if you're happy to talk about it, of course? And if all your stuff is patented and copyrighted, I suppose we can. So I'm happy to to talk about it. Let me give you a little bit of a journey into into what I've I've been studying and, and the approach that I've taken is one that I learned from my peers is, is maybe not the traditional approach um, mm-hmm. to doing a, a program in the U.S. So for, for context uh, to your listeners, PhD programs in the U.S. Uh, look different than many parts of the world where uh, you're basically starting off with a master's. And so you're doing two years of coursework typically, followed by two to three to four years of kind of intense, intensive research where you're kind of dedicating to a, a set of topics. I've just finished my second year, which normally is kind of the your, the two years of classes. Uh, in my program, we have a little bit more flexibility where you start on research and take classes. And so uh, I have started on some research that, that I'll talk about in a moment. However, in the spirit of, of being trained as a researcher, one thing I decided to do in my first year was rather than quickly try and find something that I want to study mm-hmm. and really dive into that kind of starting with the interest, I try to seek out uh, mentors and advisors around me that can teach me how to approach problems in a slightly different way than I I would normally. Mm -hmm. And so my projects uh, in my first year, especially, uh, were really tailored towards what can I learn from Jane Risen, who's a professor here in Anu Shah, for example. And so I I worked very closely with them on things that they were interested in. I I was as well, but I had never thought about it in the way that they did. And so I wouldn't say those are necessarily my, my core interests, but I thought about things about, for example, in the way that people reason and then kind of explain their decisions to others. Um, And so uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but this concept of post hoc rationalizations where we do something and only after the fact, we come up with a justification for why we did it. Um, And Mm -hmm. so if you're choosing, I don't know, chocolates and bananas, you choose Mm -hmm. chocolate. And afterwards, if somebody really presses you on why you chose a chocolate, you're like, oh, it was probably because, you know, uh, cacao is actually quite healthy and it makes me happy or something when really you just chose it because you had a sugar craving or something. I, I was interested with, along with Jane in thinking about mm. in which cases do people report their true reason? So the reason that they had even before they made the decision um, and in which cases have they kind of come up with a reason after the fact? We're still working on this project. It, it seems actually quite hard to to kind of tease these things apart because people only give you one answer usually and yeah. Our ability to kind of look inside ourselves is, is very, very limited, to put it nicely. <laughs> so we're still trying to figure that out. But it's, it's something that, that kind of got me thinking about how would I study this ability to look inside ourselves and, and just kind of think mm. more deeply about how people come to, to explain things in the world. What I'm working on now that has become a bit of like my pet project and, and that I'm really excited about is an example of something that I would have never worked on kind of at the bank or in any of my applied roles before. And I think this is what makes this project so fun for me. I'm interested in this experience that I have all the time. And I imagine others have all the time, which is the following. 
sometimes I have an idea or I have an emotion or I'm feeling something or I have an experience when I'm traveling that is very, very clear in my mind. And, or at least it, it seems very clear. Like I know for sure how I'm feeling in this moment, or I know for sure that experience that I had. But then when I try to communicate that to somebody else, effectively putting my thoughts into words, mm-hmm. the words just don't come out as clear. Okay. And this happens quite regularly for me where I have something that like, oh yeah, here's what I'm feeling or here's what I'm thinking about. And then as soon as I try to put it into words, it's not as nice. It's kind of messy. It's kind of clunky. The other person looks at me confused. And no matter how hard I try, I can't get my thoughts into words <laughs> as clearly as I would like. Sure. Now, to anybody listening to this podcast who's kind of a more applied researcher may think like, why does this matter? Like, who cares? And, and I think they'd be right in starting with that, <laughs> with that assumption. To have a certain <laughs> type of emotion or to be able to communicate a certain type of feeling very clearly, I think would be of immense value to marketing, emotional marketing. So please, I, I, I'm sure there will be a funder for this project. Just aim for the right marketeers. Yeah, so, so I think what you're saying is that there, there could be consequences down the road um, or there could be consequences to this behavior. But the experience itself and kind of what causes it and like just looking at it from a bunch of different angles might be something that like <laughs> my previous employer might not have like funded me or paid me to, to explore in depth. Now they would say, okay, great. That intuition seems right. How do we apply that? Or how do we like, what does that mean for the business? Or what does that mean for our understanding our customers? So for example, customers in many industries will submit complaints or they'll submit feedback in some way. And we typically take that at face value that like whatever they said is what they meant. But if people often say things that they don't mean, despite wanting to say things that they mean, uh, then this could be quite important. And so I agree with you that there are some practical applications and implications of kind of this thing that I'm studying, but where I'm starting off from is is a place that, well, I haven't yet been able to find people who have studied kind of this, this thing I'm calling misarticulation, this inability to articulate our thoughts clearly, or at least as clearly as we would like. And, and kind of why did that happen? When does that happen? How do people typically react when that happens? Do you try and correct yourself? Do you say things differently? Do you have any strategies for kind of communicating better? Or do you kind of let people know that that was a mistake or... And so kind of this, this I think as a psychologist, I like to call it this basic research to really just get at the subjective experience um, and understand kind of what that means for mm-hmm. people is something that, that's both new for me, but also has been quite fun. And it's been a, a nice challenge to, to kind of try and think about problems in this way, which is very different to how I thought about problems uh, in the past. Yeah. I mean, what strikes me most about the sort of the two examples that you put forward of two projects that you're working on is that these sound incredibly Mm -hmm. difficult to measure like the type of phenomena you're interested in like the first is like i i I imagine you spent many hours just trying to think about how do i get at this concept how do i actually design a study it's very methodologically challenging um you know is is that part of why it's interesting to you or <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely so so i think to me that that's I, i've been uh, admittedly seeking out projects that, that kind of have this, this sort of flavor to it so to speak you're looking for a challenge i i think so i think that there are a lot of experiences that, that to me are, are fascinating but but are, are kind of harder to to study and, and the reason why i'm seeking these out they, they may not be hard for, for everybody to study by the way like there could be fantastic researchers that they know how to get at this very quickly. If so, you should contact yeah. me uh, if you're listening. But, but I think for me, one, one of the things that, that I've been trying to, to kind of practice is to design more lab studies. Um, so this is something that, that psychologists are tend to be quite good at and, and quite creative with, is in a sense, simplifying the world to its kind of basic parts and being able to recreate that world or that situation in a lab in order to study it more deeply, in order to kind of extract these phenomena and, and, and really look at it from, from a variety of angles. And that's not something that, that you're necessarily taught to do or that you gain experience doing in the world. And so for me, in these first couple of years, at least, I've been looking for a way to contrast kind of the experiences I had designing field experiments and thinking about kind of psychology mm. in, in everyday decisions to one where I can, for things that are harder to study in the real world, what are ways to then try and kind of design these, these paradigms or, or these, 
the scenarios that, that allow me to study it in kind of a more artificial world. And then uh, hopefully as, as I progress in, in, in this line of research and in, in this career, uh, I'll be able to blend the two to both kind of study things in the field and study things in the lab and hopefully have a better understanding of, of how we make decisions and interact with the world. Does that, does that answer the question? I, I think that's, I've been looking out for these problems yeah. that are methodologically hard, but in order to, to hopefully learn a, a little bit more about what we're able to do in, in these laboratory settings and, and still keep it interesting. Yeah. No, I, I think it's spot on. I mean, I don't envy you <laughs> no. because you've set yourself up. I don't know how on earth you are going to actually conceptualize and measure these types of things. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't envy you, but it sounds like it's super interesting. Yeah. So one, one trick I, I think that social psychologists like to use or, or that, that I've learned is that sometimes to make these problems a little bit more tractable, a little bit more tangible, one thing that, that I've been focusing on is, is on the experience. So on the subjective experience that people are reporting, which makes it a little bit, a little bit more tangible. It makes it, sometimes it feels a little bit more fluffy. Uh, so I can see some people that I've worked with in the past say, oh, but it's just kind of like people's subjective reality and that doesn't reflect the real reality. And maybe they're not reporting accurately things about what they're doing. So I think these are, are critiques that, that often come up. But so much of our world, like it's subject to reality, it's what is real to us is often what, is, what we perceive to be real, right? And so I think studying things from the perspective of what are people experiencing, right? What are they reporting experiencing? In some cases, such as the ones of my projects, make things a little bit more tractable. You, you get a better understanding of the way that people come to understand the world themselves and the way that people come to describe the world themselves. And, and that matters, right? Because the way that you see the world is a way that you'll talk about it to your friends. And it's a way that like you make decisions be, if you're trying to reason through things that you're going to enjoy doing or not doing. And so I think that that's one way to both make it more tractable or kind of yeah, tangible, but also to tie it back down to, mm-hmm. to what are people actually doing? And so that's that's kind of the way that, that I've found to start navigating some of these questions. All right. Yeah, like Sarah <laughs> said, I do not envy you. I've, I mean, I've run into methodological challenges, but I wasn't seeking them out. I'll, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but then I'm quite curious, will you do the rest of your PhD also focusing on things that are incredibly difficult to measure? What, what are you wanting from the rest of your PhD, which may be another two to four years, as you said yourself? Yeah, so so I think I, I'm in the process. I think this next year I'll, I'll be focusing on trying to transition from kind of this learning phase and, and really uh, of being a student to start kind of growing into into being uh, my own researcher. Mm-hmm. I, I don't yet know exactly what I'm going to be working on. I, I have a, a portfolio of work that I didn't talk about, but that kind of carries over from, from a previous life of mine in, in banking that mm-hmm. studies financial decision making. So I know you guys had Abby Sussman on a couple of podcasts ago and, and her and I work very closely mm-hmm. on, on this line of work on, on financial decisions. We have a project that, that looks to understand how people perceive their own wealth versus the wealth of others, along with Jennifer Trueblood. Oh. And we have a project on kind of co-holding. I think that she mentioned briefly as well on when people hold debt and savings, uh, along with this is a project with Neil Mahoney and, and Jess Min. And, and so I have a portfolio of work that continues to look at financial decisions that, that I'm still quite excited about and, and will continue to explore. I think in, in terms of kind of creating a, a new identity for myself or, or kind of things that, that have piqued my interest recently is a, an area that a, a mentor of mine, Sanamil Nathan, and I have been thinking about how cognitive behavioral therapy or lessons from cognitive behavioral therapy can be used to better understand and improve everyday decisions. And so another way to think about this is how can we help people better understand themselves so mm-hmm. if, if you're familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, one of kind of the central tenets is that it, it's a little bit like thinking about thinking, working with a therapist, you're often taught to kind of think about your thoughts and think about other reasons why those thoughts may have occurred in the first place and to kind of just sit with your thoughts a little bit longer mm-hmm. and, and to recognize maybe some, some patterns that, that might be unhealthy or that may be leading you to do certain things that, that you otherwise might not want to do. And I think these, these basic lessons I imagine can be applied to many other areas of our life. Mm-hmm. And so I've been curious into kind of this, this very broad space of how do we come to understand ourselves? And I think in that sense, the work that I've described kind of fits in with, with that picture, right? So the way that we come to kind of explain or rationalize the things that we've done and the decisions that we make is one way that we come to understand ourselves, uh, assuming that you're not trying mm-hmm. to like 
lie to the researcher are hiding, people are reflecting the way that they understood that decisions for themselves. In this idea of misarticulation, I think similarly, it, it's mm -hmm. the way that people come to kind of explain things to others and this gap that, that sometimes occurs between our thoughts and our words. And so if other people take my words as given, as my words, as, thing, as what I mean, then they're going to come to understand me a little bit differently than I come to understand myself. And so I think that's an area of research that I think is quite exciting for me. I, I think that other applications could be things like how do we improve decisions based on like with this intervention of helping people to think more about the decisions that, that they're making, again, kind of drawing on, on some insights from cognitive behavioral therapy, can we help people improve, whether that be financial decisions or health decisions or everyday decisions that, that don't involve health and wealth? Mm. So to give this a bit more shape, how exactly would you think that this type of metacognition, if you want to call it that, I Sure. But how would recognizing specific patterns within your own thoughts or maybe specific negative or even positive thoughts, how exactly do you think that this would help change behavior with regards to health or financial decision making? So I think one way that it can help, and uh, so I won't claim that this is all of them or the most interesting, but one way that I think draws much more directly from the cognitive behavioral therapy literature is that having a better sense of kind of what you're doing and understanding kind of the decisions that you're making and the behaviors that, that you're enacting can help you feel a little bit more in control. Sure. And if we think back to a year such as the one that we just had, it's easy to feel like you're not in control of a lot of things. I think sure. finances often have this element to it that if, if bills are piling up or if a big purchase has kind of just hit your account, if you're looking to buy a, an expensive house or, or an expensive house, if you're just looking to buy a house, <laughs> Sure. Uh, or a car or a big asset, these things can feel rather overwhelming. Mm -hmm. If you're joining accounts with a partner or separating accounts with a partner, mm -hmm. if you're kind of kind of passing on an inheritance to somebody else or, or acquiring it, if you're choosing to retire, these are big life decisions that, that often come with, with very emotional decisions as well or very emotional components to it. Mm -hmm. And they often feel like they can be a little bit wild and, and outside of our control. And I think that Helping us understand kind of that process in the way that we move through through those those situations, I imagine this is really a conjecture here, but I, I imagine can be quite helpful in, in people navigating that. If nothing else, at reducing kind of anxiety that that comes through uh, some of these big life moments. But it could also help kind of clarify the decision. Let me give you an example from from a paper that again, kind of Sendel and and his collaborators have published, which looks at youth in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And an approach that the intervention is one that's very similar to, to what we're talking about here of helping people kind of think about their decisions a little bit more and maybe reframe kind of the approach that they were about to take. And in this in this paper, they show that when youth, teenagers mm -hmm. are kind of introduced to an intervention that helps them kind of think about thinking, mm -hmm. they, they change some key features about their behavior. Um, so when this is done in juvenile detention centers, so so children who, who have been arrested for, for something, mm -hmm. children, the, these youth are, are much less likely to end up in juvenile detention center again in the future. So those who kind of go through this, this training are much less likely mm -hmm. to commit another crime or be arrested than kids who don't go through this, this training. Kids who go through this training are likely to finish high school at a higher rate than those who don't go through this training. Um, they're less likely to kind of miss days of school. And so this is a practical application for helping people to understand themselves, I would say, and think a little bit more about the way that they think about the world that has kind of these very important gains at, at a, a pivotal mo moment in, in people's lives, right? Their, their teenage years. That, that's one example, I think, that helping people understand themselves or thinking about thinking or metacognition can, right. can change behaviors in pretty profound ways. Right. Oh, it's, it's interesting to... To hear, you know, that there is evidence on this because, you know, at a base level, I think you could probably say most people would benefit from having some therapy in general. Mm. That's why it's called therapy. Um, yeah. But the but the fact that you could deliver an intervention which utilizes some of the core concepts and is sort of deliverable on that level can have a demonstrable effect on behavior and outcomes is super interesting. And yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have to commend you for being able to tie your, your work together 
in that loop as mm. you were taking me through. And this is how misarticulation then comes in back into it. And I was like, yeah, this is very, a very cool niche you have yourself in. Thanks. Yeah. I, well, I'll admit it's the first time I'm, I'm <laughs> describing it in, in one sweep. So I, I think it went better than I was anticipating, but yeah, uh, nice yeah I think this is, it's, it's super, it's, it's a, it's a cool area. And I, I won't claim that, that I came up with it on my own, but it's, it's Never that that I'm, yeah, I'm hoping that, that other people, that I can encourage other people to kind of start thinking about it as well. And that, that would be uh, a win for all of us who, who are mm-hmm. thinking about it. Okay. So I guess that ties in really na- nicely to the next question. But what what do you want from your work in this area? What do you want from your PhD in general? Because you've already mentioned that you would be quite happy taking back a job in industry. Is is that the plan or is that an unfair question given the amount of years you still have to go? Uh, it's a long time. Uh, yeah, there's still quite a number of years to go. So so I don't know exactly where I'll be then. I think that the, the job market in academia is one that's notoriously brutal, mm-hmm. I think to put it lightly. Um, there's not many jobs out there and a lot of people kind of competing for them. Mm-hmm. And not every like university has jobs available every year. And so I think that it's something that many of us as PhD students, certainly in the US, but I imagine in other parts of the world are constantly thinking about it in the back of their minds. Like, what's next? Where, where do I go from here? What do I do with this? And if you want to be an expert researcher, and if that's the reason why you go into the PhD, then it's, you don't like thinking about that for very long, right? Because you don't like thinking that like, maybe, maybe I won't make it. I think about this, this role of, of going into industry as it gives me comfort um, because I, I know that, that I kind of thrive in that space. I enjoy working with organizations. I still do that as a PhD student and as a researcher. And so I like that environment of doing research. But my goal is to be an academic. I, I'd love to be a researcher at a, like a top institution, um, so a, a business school, or I think more applied space is, is kind of where I, I'd fit in most. So uh, either in a business school or a policy school sure. and, and thinking about kind of this intersection of these basic phenomena and kind of understanding kind of the really why our psychology works the way it does, uh, mm-hmm. but also then being able to apply it and translate that into a world that, that kind of makes sense to, to people who will then take that and use it. And, and so that was a, a long-winded answer to say, I, I mean, I want to be an academic. I'm, I think, honest about my prospects of being uh, yeah. an academic, and I'm very comfortable in industry. I, in fact, I wish more people were comfortable kind of talking about wanting to go into industry and, and uh, exploring that route, because there's a lot of good researchers out there that can do a lot of good were they in, in these industry jobs, but they sometimes don't know how to get there. Yeah. We are aware. Yeah. And uh by the way, yeah. European institutions love people who have American PhDs. So you definitely have an advantage in the European job market that we don't have, <laughs> just to say that as well. <laughs> but yeah, no, all we can say is good luck. May, mm-hmm. the, may the force be with you, whatever supernatural forces we have to <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> sell our soul to to get a job in this industry. But honestly, just from you know, these couple of minutes we've had, to talk to you about your research. It sounds super interesting and we can't wait to see what comes out of your PhD. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> then I guess moving into the, the very last two questions, uh, Sarah will ask you the very last one. I'll ask you the second to last. How do you see the future for behavioral science? Nice general question. Yeah. So, so I think one of the things that I've been looking towards the future is what is behavioral science's role in kind of tackling some of these big problems in our world? I think that if you look at kind of things that affect so many people around the world, like mental health challenges, so whether that be depression, it doesn't even have to be chronic. It could just be like periods of depression or anxiety or things like joblessness or some bigger problems like, like poverty and crime um, mm-hmm. that, are, that kind of affect many people around the world. If you, if you took those problems and you try to line them up with the number of people studying them relative to people studying other things in behavioral mm-hmm. science... I think you'd be surprised by what you'd find. I think it's a it's a relatively small number of people doing this kind of work compared to relatively large number of people affected by some of mm-hmm. these challenges. And so I'd be I'd be curious to see what behavioral science can offer for some of these challenges that affect so many of us. Even given the training that I've had in the industry and now in in the PhD, if you were to ask me, if you were to come to me and say, Oh, you study psychology. You study how people kind of think about the world. 
I've been thinking about this problem a lot and I'm super anxious or I've been feeling very depressed lately. What do you have to offer me? How do you like, how do I fix this? That's not something that I have any training in. I have no, nothing really to offer you to say, well, here's how you can improve that. If you come to me and you say, how do I buy a house? What should I be looking at in a mortgage? Well, I can give you some tips for how to buy a house and things to look for, such as like focus on the interest rate. That's pretty important. Mm -hmm. But I can't necessarily pull out like citations to say, well, here's how you make the best decision in a way that is both kind of economically the best, but also psychologically the best. Mm -hmm. I think that there's so many of these decisions that I wish we had more to offer. And it might be a function of kind of, they're very difficult problems to study and the data is not very easily available. Um, but I think that as kind of we progress and we move forward, I hope the direction that we move is one that kind of is able to provide people with more answers about how to kind of take on these everyday challenges um, that, that affect so many and, and just the sheer amount of people is so large that, that I, I wish that we had more to offer uh, on a, a couple of these, these themes. A good answer, I think, which brings us to the very, very last question, which is, is there anything you'd like to plug? <laughs> Please feel free to do now. Where should people go after this episode to keep up with your work or if there's any anywhere you would like people to check out? This is your this is your moment. Go for it. So I guess the, my, my plug is what, what I have on, on the website. My website is rafaelmbatista.com. And, and really what you can find there is just a very little about me, but it'll have things like Twitter if you want to keep up with me. I think that's where I'm, I'm most vocal. And, and more importantly, there's a, a nice link there for a, a website that, that I like to send people to, which is Give Well. So uh, I'm very much about kind of passing on. So if, this, if you found this useful, this conversation useful, feel free to pass it on in some way, either by taking on somebody, passing on the insights or we're making a donation in a way that matters. Nice plug. Amazing. Perfect. We'll make sure everything you've mentioned is linked below to reduce as much friction Great. as possible Thanks. for you, dear listener. All right. Well, in that case, Raphael, thank you so much for making the time. We wish you the best of luck in the PhD. Now that we're a bit more towards the end of our PhD, we truly, with all our life experience, wish you the best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you. ominous. <laughs> Ever have any questions, you know, to ask the true veterans in this business right now, at least in this call, <laughs> please do reach out to us. As is actually well, the case for all of our listeners, we would like to, you know, mention that we have had quite a few people reach out to us about the PhD experience. And we are, of course, always happy to answer your questions or to just have a chat with you if you so like. Okay, so that was us talking to Rafael Batista or Ralph, for short. Yeah, I thought it was a great conversation. I have to say that I think it's pretty ballsy of him to make the move from industry into academia. And that I applaud his grit or his determination to continue applying to PhDs after having been rejected apparently three times. I think that's, uh, that's pretty ballsy. I'm not entirely sure if I would have the guts or just the determination in general. I think I'd just be crying in the corner, to be quite honest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that isn't that just a typical Tuesday for us, crying in the corner somewhere? I no, mean, I, I, know. Ha I have shifted it to my Wednesday. I got too busy beforehand. Mm -hmm. I mean, all all jokes aside, I always enjoy it immensely when we have fellow PhD students coming on the show to talk to us. I mean, I was really interested to hear Raf's sort of reason for why to come back and do the PhD, especially after having such a good career with like, you know, prospects to keep moving up that career ladder in as a sort of applied behavioral scientist. So it was really nice to hear that perspective. And also all of this research on metacognition. I mean, I am just sort of a bit stumped on how on earth anyone can <laughs> study this, at least from a quantitative mm. perspective and measuring things. I mean, I'm, I think back to our conversation with uh, Christina Bicchieri and, you know, how she was able to do something which seemed impossible at the time, which was actually create measures of social norms, something mm. that seems so elusive. So not saying it's impossible. I'm going to love 
watching and seeing how on earth anyone conceptualizes and and measures such weird concepts as like misarticulation and uh, this post hoc rationalization uh, mm. but yeah was a super cool conversation from my part yeah absolutely i mean how are you even going to measure like it is Obviously, you as a person knows what you're trying to say, but obviously the only observable outcome is, of course, what you're saying, which you recognize as a mismatch between what you've experienced and what you're trying to communicate. But given that you can't even express your own internals, how on earth are you going to convey them to a researcher? How will you ever measure that type of discrepancy? I think from a methodological perspective, it's a nightmare. It's a very interesting mm. nightmare, but it's a nightmare. And I, I wish him the best of luck with that. I, I think it's it's really interesting to see that this that he he was a, an applied behavioral scientist or a behavioral practitioner or a behavioral engineer, if you will. And then he decided to go back into what, what he considers to be the, the training of, the become a, of becoming a proper researcher. And that then the first thing he aims for are extremely challenging methodological approaches. I find it... Uh, a very interesting way of, of going about it. But we can definitely say now with complete certainty that Raph is not lazy. <laughs> he yeah, likes challenge. No. It, but it makes complete sense to me. Like why, if Raph was interested in these types of questions, why you know doing a PhD is sort of the only accessible place you can go to look into these types of weird abstract questions. Because I think as Raf said was no manager is ever going to fund a project <laughs> where you sort of look into, you know, do people mean what they say or do they say what they mean to put things very sort of abstractly. Yeah. And, <laughs> or and can they simply. even say what they mean? Yeah. I mean, this, I was thinking about it in our conversation, it creates this like weird, like circular logic of where we're interested in asking people about their internal reality. But yeah. we also acknowledge that people have trouble or can't articulate their internal reality externally. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. it sort of feeds back on each other. So how are they going to get out of that circular loop where you sort of say, People, people can tell us, people are the best experts to tell us what they think, but people can't mm -hmm. articulate to us what they think. I, I honestly feel like it's a, it's one of these things that won't be, the gap won't be able to be officially closed until we sort of develop some insane technology, which like translates <laughs> brain waves into pictures and sounds and nope. colors, right? Or nonverbal. <laughs> Yeah, oh, literally. Just, yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can you imagine that you that we're gonna maybe get to a future where a person can actually condense the, an, an experience that they've themselves had, both sensory, experiential, emotional, condense this into something that is actually digestible for another person, so that they can experience exactly what the other person has experienced. This, I mean, that would be a massive scientific breakthrough, obviously. I think, I think we might be a couple of decades off that one. But it's, it's incredibly fascinating from all aspects, both marketing, philosophical, behavioral, scientific. It's, this is a very interesting topic to consider from, from different perspectives. So uh, I wish Raf the best of luck with it. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll keep my eyes Me peeled too. on his research. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as we said, guys, everything will be linked below a citation, uh, I think that Raf mentioned, and also links to his personal website and uh, uh, the charity that he mentioned in case you are in a giving mood. <laughs> And don't actually forget, we are also in quite giving moods. And as PhD students who can help out others, if you have more questions about doing a PhD in behavioral science, please do reach out to us. We mentioned this one saying uh, goodbye to Ralph, but we actually have quite a few people reaching out to us with questions about doing a PhD in behavioral science, sometimes even specifically about the programs that we're in, so Warwick and Nottingham respectively. Honestly, if you have any questions, do reach out to us. We're more than happy to help you out uh, in the same way that we have wished someone had helped us out <laughs> when selecting a PhD yeah. program or when being in a PhD program. So uh, we, we hope to, to give on the, the good karma. And uh, yeah, so that is it for today's episode. We hope you thought it was educational, entertaining, thought-provoking, or at least somewhat seemingly useful to kill time. And as always, we hope you have a great week and we hope to see you again next week. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.
You're the dummy that don't believe in science All your projects always be denying You're the one to love, you're the one I wanna give to